Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for giving us this glorious vision of the new world that you are bringing us to. And we pray now that you'd help me to preach your word with faithfulness and with clarity. And may your spirit so work in our hearts that you create within us a deep longing and anticipation for that day when we will see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, after nine months of COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions, I wonder whether you are now longing for it all to end. Longing to finally be able to meet other people without restrictions, uh, to go out without wearing a face mask, uh, to no longer have to constantly sanitize your hands until they're, they're dry, uh, to, to be able to attend church and sing and, and participate in the Lord's Supper like we used to. Longing to uh, an end to the isolation, uh, to the loneliness and, and to the uncertainty. Well, I'm sure you are. Uh, That deep longing that we feel uh, right now is is actually a reflection of an even deeper longing, a longing that we have for a perfect world, a a world where there's no more sickness or suffering, uh, no more disease or death, no more separation from loved ones, uh, no more uncertainty about the future. Our longing for the end of COVID-19 reflects our deeper longing for heaven. Well, Revelation chapter 21 is is the climax and the pinnacle of all of Scripture. Here we are shown a glorious vision of the end, of, of a new creation where all of our deepest longings will be fulfilled fully and forever, where all the sufferings of this world will pass away, never to be experienced again where we will be with the glorious Lord of love forever. And uh, my hope this morning is this passage warms our hearts and stirs in us such, such hope and joy that we long for that glorious day to come. Well, John begins in verse 1. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And see, John's vision is of a totally renewed creation, totally transformed. Uh, The world as we know it with its chaos and disorder uh, replaced with a perfect world of blessing. Of course, the Bible begins with those words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He now God creates a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, that good world that God had made at the beginning was, was cursed because of human sin. Humanity rejected God's rightful rule. As a result, uh, work became painful and, and our relationships were full of conflict and we were separated from God's presence and destined to die. But here God promises in the future to create a new heavens and a new earth. This present world will pass away. And notice in this new world there will be no more sea. No more sea means no more possibility of of anything spoiling this world. No more rebellion or conflict or suffering or, or, or pain because throughout the Bible, the sea, the waters of the sea depict the chaos and death and, and opposition to God's rule and God's people. Now, in Revelation, the sea is where the beasts come from, deceiving and, and persecuting God's people. But in the new creation, the sea is no more. Now, in Revelation 20, the devil and his angels and, and death and the grave and all who have opposed God's rule are cast away into the lake of fire. And this new creation, in all of its perfection and goodness, will come and will last forever, never to be fallen again. Well, what will that new creation be like? Well, firstly, in our passage, we see that the new cre- in the new creation, God will live with his people. In the new creation, God will live with his people. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Now, it's helpful to ask the question, what, what is it about heaven that makes it so attractive to us? What makes heaven, heaven? Perhaps we say no more suffering, or, or no more death, or, or being reunited with our loved ones, or, or seeing with our eyes what we now only see with faith. Now, those are all good things to look forward to, but they're not the best thing about heaven. The, the best thing about heaven, the thing that makes heaven heaven, is that we will be with God, our creator, forever. John sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride prepared for her husband. Now, throughout the Bible, God's people are his bride. Now, God longs to enter into a covenant relationship with his people. And so in Sinai, God calls his people to relationship with him as his special people. Now, in Ephesians 5, we're told husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives are to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ because our human marriages are to reflect the ultimate marriage between Jesus and his church. And in Revelation 19, that, that Bible storyline climaxes with the marriage between Christ and his people. We read in Revelation 19, verse 7, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Throughout the Bible, God's people are his bride. And as this new creation dawns, God's bride, his people, will be presented to Jesus, her husband. Uh, that is what this city, the New Jerusalem, represents. This, this city is you and me. We are God's bride. And one day we will no longer be separated from Christ like heaven is from earth. We will dwell with our Saviour forever, eternally in his presence, in the deepest intimacy and joy. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Now God dwelt with his people at Eden, but they were cast out. God dwelt with his people in the temple in Jerusalem, but it was destroyed. God dwelt with his people through his son, Jesus Christ, but he ascended to heaven. God dwells in us now by his Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts. But one day we will see God face to face. We'll be reunited with our Savior and we will enjoy the perfect marriage with him as we live in his perfect presence. See, what makes heaven so good? is that God will be there. We will be with him. And that will be the ultimate joy. For he is the perfection of all goodness and love. That's point one. In the new creation, God will dwell with his people. Well, secondly, in the new creation, suffering and death will be no more. In the new creation, suffering and death will be no more. None of us are strangers to the shadow of death that is cast over our world. Uh, the present pandemic is a painful reminder to us that we, we live in a, in, a, in a broken world uh, that is under the judgment of God. Uh, the blessings of the Garden of Eden have long been lost because of human sin. And the stain of sin touches all as we, as we grow old, as we lose our loved ones as we come face to face with devastating disease, as we experience disappointments, as we tremble before death. We live in a world where tears and brokenness and anxiety and depression and relationship breakdown are the norm, where, where times of happiness do not last forever. But we have here 
the most glorious promise of all. That one day, as God promised to Abraham, all the curses of this world will one day be overturned and replaced with eternal blessing. Verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. What beautiful words those are. Just imagine, no more separation from loved ones. No more cancers. No more broken relationships, no more natural disasters, no more pandemics, no more disappointments, no more job losses, no more persecutions, no more fears and worries, no more tears and pain, no more suffering and no more death. This broken world will one day pass away and those things will be of the past. Can you imagine such a world? Do you long for such a world? Well, perhaps it sounds too good to be true, but God wants us to be absolutely sure that this is for real. This new creation is not a fiction and it is not a dream. In verse 5, he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God promises that these words are true. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of the universe and the uh, consummator of it. He will finish what he began. And we can believe this, and we can hope in it and live in the light of it. And what a difference this hope can make to our lives. If the new creation is real, then it means that all of our suffering will end one day. No matter what we are going through right now, we can know for certain it will finish one day. Even if our marriage breaks up, or if we lose our job, or when we're in the pits of depression, if we're in financial problems, if our family rejects us, if we've lost a precious loved one, if we receive a terminal diagnosis, if we're on our deathbed, no matter what the suffering, no matter what the pain, the Christian can look at the future with real hope. Our sufferings will not go on forever. There will be an end to our tears one day, an end to the pain when Jesus returns. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. There will be perfect hope, perfect relationships, perfect joy for all eternity. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Well, that's point two. In the new creation, suffering and death will be no more. Well, finally, in the new creation, sin will be eliminated forever. In the new creation, sin will be eliminated forever. In, in verses six to eight, we're told who will enjoy this new creation and who won't. Uh, verse 6, he says, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Uh, here we're told a place in this new creation is offered freely to anyone who will accept it. 
You know, Jesus is this spring of the water of life. He, he died on the cross. He, he took the punishment that we deserve for our sins in our place. He died so that we might be washed clean and offered this free gift of eternal life. And, and, and as we ex- receive that gift and accept it and, and persevere in trusting in Jesus to the end, we will receive this precious inheritance, a place in the new creation. Now that's what verse 7 means when it talks about the one who conquers. The one who conquers is the one who will not be allured away from Christ by the things of this world. The one who conquers will be the one who, who does not give up following Jesus, even when they suffer for his sake. The one who conquers is the one who will hold tightly to this gift, who will trust Christ to the end, who will will keep going no matter what they suffer for Christ, knowing it will be worth it because they are one of God's children and they have this glorious inheritance, a place in the new creation. Well, in verse 8, we're also reminded of the fate of those who do not trust in Christ. Verse 8, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Here we're told, frankly, not everyone will have a place in that new creation. Here we are warned that those who who persist in sin, who continue to reject Christ's rule, will face God's eternal judgment in the lake of fire. The first death is physical death. The second death is, is, is eternal conscious torment, separated from God and his blessing. It's symbolized here by the lake of burning fire and sulfur. And that will be the fate, we're told, of the the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, those who are not willing to count the cost of following Jesus, who give up when it's tough. And that will be the fate of of murderers and the sexually immoral and sorcerers and idolaters and and all liars, those who have, have, uh, not just those who have committed these sins, but those whose lives are full of unrepentant sins like these. The new creation will only be perfect if sin is eliminated from it forever. We see here there can be no heaven without hell. For only the permanent and eternal punishment of those who persist in sin can secure the permanent security and bliss of the new world. And so here is a severe warning. Don't be tempted by sin away from Jesus Christ. This new creation, it will be so good. Nothing in this world is worth losing your place in that new creation. Uh, Choosing to to keep your family happy instead of converting and following Christ, that's foolishness. Choosing to to, to give in to to, to the homosexual desires we struggle with instead of following Christ's desires. It won't be worth it in the end. Choosing worldly riches and career advancement over sacrificial service of the gospel, it will not pay searching for sexual fulfillment in, in pornography or an illicit relationship. It promises so much, but it will not be worth it when we find ourselves in the lake of fire. The new creation is so good, it is worth leaving everything behind for it. Do not lose it. Now, C.S. Lewis tells a story of some children uh, living in a slum, uh, playing uh, with mud by the side of the road. A man comes to them and, and offers to let them live in a mansion by the seaside where they can play by the beach. What a tragedy it would be 
if those children turned down the holiday of a lifetime so that they can continue playing in the mud. And yet that is what many people in this world do. Giving up the bliss of eternal blessing in the presence of God for the temporary muddy pleasures of this life. The new creation will be wonderful beyond our wildest imagination. But why would you ever choose the lake of fire instead of the bliss of heaven? In the new creation, God's people will live in God's place under God's blessing and rule. There will be no more conflict, no more curse, no more disappointments, no more disease, no more darkness. There will be no more death. If you've not yet believed in Jesus Christ this morning, will you please turn to him? Drink from this water of life that he he offers to you. Leave your old life of sin. Leave the mud. Turn to Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord. Take hold of these eternal treasures. You will have real hope for the future. That will not disappoint and you will have real joy in the present as you look forward to it. If you're uh, someone who is uh, backsliding away from Christ or if you're being tempted to give up being a Christian, come back to Jesus. See the good things he's promised to you. Don't give it up for the things of this world. With this vision of the new creation, God wants us to encourage us to press on in living for Jesus Christ. Because our future, if we are Christian, is beyond our wildest imagination. And as we ponder our eternal destiny, God's word ought to fill us with joy and hope and longing. Now, if we long for COVID-19 and all these restrictions to be to be over, how much more should we long for this new creation? And we have a message for the world. In all of its suffering and despair, we have a message of eternal life for those who trust in Christ. So even as we struggle with this uh, isolation uh, and suffering and the uncertainty of this pandemic, which just seems to go on and on and on, let us remind ourselves it will not go on forever. And let us remind ourselves and others where real hope can be found. For we have a future with Jesus Christ in a whole new creation where there will be no more tears and there will be no more death. Do you long for it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this glorious future that you have promised to us. We thank you that you not only save us from our sins, but you are bringing us into a renewed world where we can see you face to face. We thank you that one day all that spoils this world will be no more. And we can enjoy the blessing and the joy of intimate relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to long for that day. And as we wait for Jesus to return, help us to be faithful in following him. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.